person wrote to me, Berndt kept referring to mind only. But I'm not quite sure what he means. Can you be more specific? Are you saying that all of phenomenal experience is mind only? That all of phenomenal experience is an illusion? Is the only substantial reality the awareness of phenomenal experience? The person stressed awareness. Is the only substantial reality the awareness of phenomenal experience? So let's see. I, I didn't pre plan this. I want to really speak out of this very moment. First, I would like to say to you, who kindly sent me the email, and I want to say it to all of us, including myself, good questions. Please continue asking. And maybe please continue asking even if the answer doesn't come because asking is something like a catalyst in our practice and just imagine if the answer really came perhaps from that point on our practice might be pretty stale. Then when I read and reread your email, I just looked at a sentence like, are you saying that all of phenomenal experience is an illusion? Or are you saying that all of phenomenal experience is mind only. Maybe not to disappoint you now, out of the blue, I'm saying this is what I'm saying. But that's not so important. But when I read your sentences, I thought of um, Buddha Shakyamuni already taught that the Dharma, the practice of the Dharma, was steering free of two extreme views. And many teachers, women and men after him, have been repeating this. And then, of course, there might be a little confusion because sometimes they talk differently about what the two extreme views are. But already the historical Buddha said what we should be free of because it causes a lot of suffering is on the one hand the view of eternalism and on the other hand the view of annihilationism difficult word annihilationism speaking of difficult words maybe we think well i'm not holding these views i'm not a philosopher A simple translation of these difficult terms would be the view of existence and the view of non-existence. So here's the tricky business, because Buddhism teaches 
whenever we hold on to a view of existence and whenever we hold on to a view of non-existence and please just ask yourself but I would say we do most of the time then we are actually not practicing the Dharma and we are actually causing suffering for ourselves and others. So I would say Dharma practice, Zazen practice and many other practices of Buddhism are a way to find a balance between extreme views. That's why this practice is also called the middle way. So to say mind only, to ask questions about mind only, to talk about mind only, to listen to mind only, to explore mind only, and to embody mind only is a practice that helps us find a balance in the middle. I want to come back to your email because I think that maybe I'm not answering your questions. Are you saying that all phenomenal experience is an illusion? So I don't know what you think when you hear the word illusion, but many people think it's something that doesn't exist. So here we have it. People who maybe think that phenomena are an illusion are falling into the extreme view of non-existence or annihilationism. Is the only substantial reality the awareness of phenomenal experience? I would say great question. Please explore. But I'm not confirming this view. Because then the awareness would be an existence. And once again, I would fall into an extreme view. So you see, this is tricky business. So I'm very aware, and maybe some of you as well, as mind only where it is a school of Buddhism, especially in Tibetan Buddhism, is very much concerned with actually confirming what is a valid cognition. My naive translation of valid cognition would be what is really real? With a lot of respect, I want to vo voice my doubt about this, this kind of approach to practice. I'm not sure if we humans can ever know what a valid cognition is. In order to have a valid cognition of the universe, we would need to step outside of our human minds. And this we can't. And yet, I think these attempts to understand mind only in practice, they are very valid. They are important. But the more I look into this, the more I feel mind only is a practice. Zazen is the practice of mind only. And mind only is the practice of Zazen. It's practice of finding a balance right in the middle of all that is in the middle between inside and outside, in the middle between you and me, 
in the middle between this exists and this exists not. In the middle. In the middle. What I actually want to share with you is a passage from Genjo Koan by Dogen Zenji. <laughs> this is just talking about my perception. How does its story go? Like people ask you, if you, if for the rest of your life you had to live on an isolated island, which book would you take? Right now, I would say not a book, just Genjo Koan. It's it's just three printed pages. Maybe I'm out of my mind, but I'm saying, if people think. What's maybe the one book I should read about Zen or Buddhism? I would suggest Genjo Koan. So right in the middle, there's a passage that always has been touching me. Even now I'm saying this and I get goosebumps. 20 years ago, I read it and got goosebumps. And I didn't know why. And I don't want to say now I understand why, because I don't. But I want to look at, I want to look at it with you for a few minutes, because I think I started thinking a few years back that in this passage, Dogen Zenji teaches mind only. And then I came across a wonderful book by Okumura Roshi. It's a commentary on the Genjo Koan. And of course, I was very happy to find out that Okumura Roshi, who's very much a scholar, points out that in this passage, that you have on your screen, Dogen Zenji actually quotes Asanga. And Asanga is an Indian Buddhist master who, together with his brother Vasubandhu, nowadays they are described as the founders of the mind only school of Buddhism. Isn't that interesting? I think that's really interesting. Allow me to read this to you. When Dharma does not fill your whole body and mind, you think it is already sufficient. When Dharma fills your body and mind, you understand that something is missing. For example, when you sail out in a boat to the midst of an ocean where no land is in sight, and view the four directions, the ocean looks circular and does not look any other way. But the ocean is neither round nor square. Its features are infinite in variety. It is like a palace. It is like a jewel. It only looks circular as far as you can see at that time. All things are like this. Though there are many features in the dusty world and the world beyond conditions, you see and understand only what your eye of practice can reach. In order to learn the nature of the myriad things, you must know that although they may look round or square, the other features of oceans and mountains are infinite in variety. Whole worlds are there. It is, it is so not only around you, but also directly beneath your feet or in a drop of water. Dogen Zenji. It is, not, it is so not only around you, but directly in front of your eyes on your computer screen or in a drop of water. 
So far, so good. Dogen Zenji. The few things I want to point out, and I think they might be tricky, are when Dharma does not fill your whole body and mind, so when you and Dharma, when we and Dharma does not merge yet. And then Dogen says, you think it is already sufficient. I might say, you might think it's already sufficient. Just what I, now what I think about this at this point in my practice is, probably not this is probably not true for all of us, but hopefully for quite a few people, that when we first encounter Zen or Buddhism or meditation, we are infatuated or fall in love. We might think Oh, here I really found something, either a practice like meditation or zazen or teaching, like the teaching of mind only or the middle way. And this is actually something, maybe now my deep questioning stops, or maybe now I found a practice to deal with all the stress in my life, whatever. And I would say, oh, and this first coming to Dharma can be a fraction of a second, it can be a day, it can be a year, it can be 20 years. And it also can be again tomorrow. And it can disappear and reappear and it's an important phase. And then Dogen says, when Dharma fills your body and mind, you understand that something is missing. That's typical Dogen. I always find very beautiful what he does in words. Unfortunately, I can only read it in English. So here he says something really interesting first part of the sentence, when Dharma fills your body and mind. When something fills this almost empty bottle, for example, water, nothing is missing. It's full. It's full. When something fills us, don't we have a sense of completion, of wholeness? when a practice, a teaching fills us. And here comes Dogen and he says, you understand that something is missing. And this, I can only speak from my own practice, this is really a tricky point. Do we want to acknowledge it? I'm not sure, but I try. And then he says, for example, I hope that's clear. He's saying, and now I'm giving you an example for something is missing when Dharma fills your body and mind. And what comes next is highly biographical because Dogen as a very young man sailed to China from Japan. And as far as I know, not many people in the early 13th century in Japan set out to sail onto the open ocean because it was dangerous. The open ocean where no land is inside, is in sight. And then you view the four directions. It's very conventional, like a simple description of what we all know. But maybe Dogen didn't know it because he was never out on the ocean and he was not prepared for what he saw. Namely, the ocean is round, it's circular. And it doesn't look any other way. 
I think he was surprised by what he saw and it had a deep effect, effect on him. But he also says, it does not look any other way. What I think he means is, it does not look any other way for human beings with two functioning eyes and a functioning brain and nervous system. They all see the same. Whether they are Japanese people in the 13th century or Irish, Northern Irish people in the 21st century. Or even if in the 13th century we would have been able to take somebody from Tibet who had never even seen the shoreline of the ocean onto the ocean, this person would have seen something that's vast and circular because it cannot be any other way. And maybe then this person would have fainted. I don't know. And then Dogen says, but the ocean is neither round nor square. Its features are infinite in variety. Now, of course, we could say, well, come on, we know this. Just look at a map of the Pacific Ocean and you know it's infinite in variety. It's not round. But Dogen does not refer to what we could call the objective phenomenal world. He actually tries to teach us what I tried to point out in the beginning. That's a tricky thing. The objective phenomenal world, the way things really are, the way oceans are, planets, but also the way Monica is and the way Paul is, is not accessible to us. Because all we have is our individual and collective human perception. And I'm suggesting to you that this is the reason why Dogen writes, when Dharma fills your body and mind, you understand that something is missing. Because when the Dharma of everything is mind only fills your body and mind, you understand what's missing. You understand that when you look at another person, when I look at Dionysos, who hasn't been around in a while, at least in my perception, I look at my own mind. I don't look at Dionysos. I don't know Dionysos. But the ocean is neither round nor square. This I just translated into, I don't know Dionysos. I could say he's round or he's square, but he's not, because his features are infinite in variety. And now here's the Asanga quote. This is what Dogen took from Asanga. It is like a palace. It is like a jewel. In a childlike -like language, I mean this 100% positive, not in an abstract language. Dogen says, for fish, the ocean is a palace. And for fighting gods in the sky, it's a necklace, it's pearls, it's a jewel. It only looks circular as far as you can see at that time. So when we realize mind only, we realize Dharma and are liberated on the spot. Because we realize that there are no separate things in the whole universe. You could say that's a positive aspect of realizing mind only. At the same time, we understand that something is missing. And that's hard for us humans to take. What's missing, 
once again is I will never ever understand or taste or see the infinite features of the ocean in all their variety but I will also never really see the infinite features of Wendy in all her variety. I will not even see, that's the trickiest point, the infinite features of Bernd in all of his variety. And then Dogen says, all things are like this. Though there are many features in the dusty world, the conventional world, the worlds of self and other, and many features in the world beyond conditions, in the world of emptiness, you see and understand only what your eye of practice can reach. In order to learn through practice the nature of the myriad things, you must know that although they may look round or square, the other features of oceans and mountains are infinite in variety. Whole worlds are there. It is so not only around you, but also directly beneath your feet or in a drop of water. And now we might think, oh yeah, that sounds wonderful. I want to see and experience the whole worlds that are there in a drop of water. And Dharma can teach me this. But here again, when this Dharma fills your body and mind, you understand that something is missing. In Bendawa, another text by Dogen Zenji, he has an equally hymnic praise, a hymnic appraisal, a joyful appraisal, wonderful appraisal of reality. Just like here, whole worlds are there, infinite in variety. And then Dogen says, however, this does not appear within perception because it is unconditioned, it is immediate realization. It is not within perception. You can't see it, but you can see that something is missing. And that's maybe one of the deepest insights you can have in your life. So thank you for listening.